a, we have a fun-packed rest of the morning, um, I, and I'm especially delighted to introduce our next speakers, uh, Judd Anton and Andrew Fiore. Um, they both work at Facebook. Um, Judd is a UX research manager, and Andrew is a growth research team lead, and I'm sure they'll explain what the difference is. Um, <laughs> um, Judd focuses on bringing theories and practices of social psychology, social computing, and HCI, human-computer interaction, to bear to improve Facebook's products. Um, they use methods ranging from ethnographic field work uh, to big data analysis to understand products like newsfeed, ads, photos, and groups. In 2011, Judd was named one of MIT Technology Review's top innovators under 35. Andrew leads uh, the, the growth research team at Facebook, um, which is a program of research to understand and measure the benefits, risks, and barriers of adoption of information and communication technologies in emerging markets. I didn't know this. Previously, <laughs> as a member of the data science team at Facebook, he studied social dynamics um, in online groups. But perhaps the most important feature of both of our speakers is they both earned PhDs at the UC Berkeley School of Information, and we are really pleased to have them back to join us today. Welcome, Judd and Andrew. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be back. I don't get to campus as often as I'd like, and when I do, it just gives me all the good feels, you know, the, the nostalgia. Um, so Andrew and I, I think, are gonna hopefully talk for like 15 or 20 minutes and then uh, a max, and then uh, are open to any questions you have. Um, I think we just wanna talk basically about the practice of data science in our work, and fundamentally about how it's part of mixed method strategies. Um, so, you know, in case it wasn't clear, Facebook is not alone in, in uh, living in a world that is awash in data. Uh, you know, so we have a lot of data to work with, and that, you know, makes a lot of people's eyes sort of go wide, especially when they think about data science. And, and that's great, except it has some uh, occasional unfortunate consequences, which is you can become obsessed with metrics, right? And here's it, so here's a proposition. I propose that whatever you want, whatever you care about, I can generate a metric from data, from behavioral data, and then I can make changes to the project, to the product, and move that metric. I, I bet you, whatever you put to me, or to Andrew, we can do that. Is that real? Does that capture anything about the user experience? Like, no. Nine out of ten times, no. Um, and so there are specific things that happen when you become obsessed with data, I think. And, and I want to talk about two of them. The, the, first, the first one is that you end up in a, in a local maximum, right? Where what you're doing is sort of uh, optimizing metrics into a place where you have, you have sort of arrived at a place where you're doing fine, but you're missing the real opportunities for adding additional value. The second thing you can do is back yourself into a corner where you've defined these metrics and optimized the hell out of them until there is no design move you can make. There is no change you can make to the user experience that will not negatively impact a metric you care about. I think that our point of view is those are undesirable outcomes. <laughs> And that it's okay to have a design holistic perspective and to think about design intuition, to bring qualitative and other quantitative methods into play. That we can do that in a way that emphasizes humanity, in which we don't think of people as uh, rows and tables or an increment to our end, but that they are just people with stories. And that those stories and their experiences and the whys and the hows are really important. And in doing so, we end up with empathy, and I think losing your empathy for people, whether you're, whatever you're doing, whatever kind of analysis you're doing, is one of the cardinal sins. And so I think Andrew and I begin with the, the understanding that a multi-method strategy, which incorporates the practices of data science, but also many other types of research, is sort of a key to keeping this holistic perspective. Great. So when we think about sort of how we construct a mixed methods approach, you know, we come at this, and, and this is something that I think Judd and I both, you know, learned a lot about when we were PhD students at the iSchool, that, you know, there, there are all sorts of different ways to approach the same phenomena. And some of those operate at different levels of analysis. So when we talk about how we're going to combine approaches for product research or for growth research at Facebook, 
you know, we think about are we doing research kind of at the level of kind of aggregate societies, communities, organizations? Are we thinking about the interpersonal interaction level? Are we thinking about the individual level? So all of the, you know, we, we sort of span the whole range here in terms of the backgrounds of people on the research teams and in terms of the approaches that we take to a given problem. So, you know, we, we, we sort of start at the very high level with demography, understanding populations, and the analytics organization at Facebook also does a great job, highly proficient working with the behavioral data on the site to understand what exactly are people doing? You know, where are they coming from? Who's, who's signing up? You know, market research speaks to that. You know, we do a lot of research sort of in the vein of what the academic community calls social computing, uh, drawing on perspectives from sociology, anthropology, HCI, and psychology. So again, ranging from sort of the aggregate social level all the way down to how does one individual interact with one, you know, sort of with one interface. So we have to sort of take all those perspectives into account when we're trying to design appropriate research that speaks to the kind of holistic uh, question. So this is sort of a typical product research cycle at Facebook. And this is not to say that you know, this is the entirety of the work we do, but this is sort of a core part of it where we, again, use mixed methods approaches in this cycle of building, understanding, prototyping, building some more. And we want to approach this as kind of an iterative refinement where we're getting both qualitative and quantitative inputs <laughs> into the, the product design process. This is one of two cycles we'll talk about. So this is sort of a product research cycle. Now let's talk a little bit more about kind of the overall approach to you know, using science, data science, social science, to informing, to informing product development and the understanding of Facebook's growth. So when you think about the scientific method, you usually think of a process where you, you know, specify hypotheses that are hopefully informed by theory, that you develop experiments that will test those hypotheses, you look at the outcome of the experiment, you kind of iterate. You say, all right, we've updated our understanding, let's try again and refine what we know. So this is sort of a typical deductive process. This is where we start again with kind of a theory that leads to a hypothesis, that leads to some observations, that leads, that leads to confirmation. This tends to be quantitatively oriented. We tend to sort of test hypotheses using experiments, using quantitative surveys. We do formal hypothesis tests with statistical methods. So th this is, you know, if, if, if I'm remembering my Latin correctly, this is sort of like leading from deduction, leading from a theory sort of down to observations. So the theory is sort of the overarching framework that we need to have in place in order to specify these things correctly. So this is a really common mode of operating, especially when, you, when you're talking to people who are quantitatively oriented. They, they, you know, they think this is kind of the whole of the science. And what I would argue is that, in fact, you need to have sort of the complementary perspective as well. So an inductive approach where you sort of build up to hypotheses and theories from individual observations the, the reason that you need to do this is because often when you're dealing with a new domain, which we do all the time at Facebook, you don't know what you don't know. So you have to go into the field, you have to go talk to people, interviews, focus groups. You know, on the growth research team, we do a lot of ethnographies and interviews in emerging markets. We go into people's homes in India and Indonesia and other places and talk to them about technology, their attitudes toward technology. We try to understand what is it that you know, motivates you to use a cell phone, to get online, and you know, if there aren't sufficient motivators, you know, what would be motivating? What are your needs in life that we could meet with technology? And similarly, sort of, what are the barriers to getting online? You know, is, it, is it about cost? Is it about you know, proficiency? Is it about literacy? There are all sorts of possibilities here. Is it just simply that the technologies aren't designed to fit into your life in the way that they're designed to fit into the, to our lives in the US? Uh, so, so to approach these, these sort of more qualitative questions, we, we use a combination of, of methods and ideally, when we have sort of both of these you know, paradigms clicking at once, we end up in cycle number two, which is sort of this cycle of induction and deduction, where we use inductive approaches to generate hypotheses to understand what we don't know. And then we use deductive approaches to sort of refine, test, and scope those insights. So we talk to somebody in India who says, you know, my phone is too hard to use. We say, all right, that's, that's an N of one. Maybe we have an N of five or 10. We talk to a few more people, we hear this. We say, we've identified a pattern, and then we want to use a complementary approach, say with an experiment to deploy a better interface, or a survey to understand how many people does this really affect at the population level. And then we sort of repeat that process of sort of developing, identifying new patterns and then developing new ways to scope and sort of specify them more precisely. Can I, can I just add one thing there? I think yeah. that's such a great point, and I want to parrot uh, our friend and colleague, Koi Cheshire, for a second, who uh, talks a lot about what you can learn from small data. 
mm -hmm. right? And I think the thing, the reason it's so important that in cycle is because in our work, sometimes we find people who are skeptical about the inductive approach and what you can gain from qualitative work. And I think there's two like easy answers to that. And to me, they both add up to the fact that you just can't afford to be sort of have your blinders on in, in, in the research field anymore. But the two specific things are, number one, well, data science is great at understanding patterns, like what's going on. But as far as how it's going on and why things are happening, it doesn't tell us much at all. The other thing is, look at qualitative work. And like Andrew was saying, okay, you go out into the field, you have an N of one, right? You observe a behavior. Um, even with an N of one, you have a very powerful thing, and that's an existence proof. Right? Think of how powerful that is. Right? Here's a behavior, an attitude, a phenomenon. Like, if you're just sitting in Menlo Park at Facebook's offices, it might exist, it might not. We can't tell from our log data. Go out into the field and hear a story and all of a sudden, this is a real thing. How prevalent is it? Well, that's a thing we can find out with maybe a large scale survey, but an existence proof is powerful. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And just anecdotally from talking to some of the product managers and designers that we work with, and we often will bring, we'll bring folks from the product team into the field with us. They, they shadow interviews you know, in, in emerging markets and try to understand more about the experience of the products they're building in a very different context, perhaps with low-end devices, with bad connectivity. And you know, it's, it's revelatory for them. I mean, I've had them, say, I've had them say to me on a number of occasions, and Jed, I'm sure you've had this experience too, that you know, I just had no idea. I thought we'd go in and find like a little usability problem or like a button that could be you know, different color or like right. text that could be a little different. They, say, they come back and say, this is like a conceptual problem. You know, this right. is a mismatch between people's expectations, between their understanding of what an app is or what a website is. And, and the reality that you know, we've designed these tools, in many cases with, you know, with, with Westerners in mind, yeah. with people who you know, live in the Bay Area. And there's a very different sense, that, sense of sort of um, familiarity with, with how these things typically go. What does it mean to even create an account? Yep. What, what is that? What's an email address? What's a password for? Why, why, why would I have this? So and, and there are no data analytics strategies that would have revealed that for those people, just to be clear. Nothing you could have yeah. done with your big data sitting in front of your R console would have worked. Yeah. Yeah, and Nothing. I think, and that's really key because you know the, and this is something that I think you know Judd and I and other and other researchers at Facebook are really advocating for because Facebook, like a lot of tech companies, is highly proficient in terms of quantitative analytics. You know, extremely good at detecting patterns in data, and then as Judd mentioned earlier, not necessarily so good at identifying the sort of hows and whys behind the behaviors. Not through any fault of theirs, just because that quantitative approach does not give you that does not give you visibility into that. It doesn't let you understand why somebody is, you know, doing behavior X and not behavior Y. Mm -hmm. So now I think, like uh, having uh, been pretty high level thus far, we wanted to share some slightly more granular examples of the ways in which we apply data science in combination with other methods um, in our daily work, um, in growth, uh, and on UX. Um, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll start and, sure. and just sort of give, give an example, which is um, one of the ways in which uh, <laughs> large-scale data analytics has been super powerful for us is in sampling for other types of work. So one thing we can do is, okay, we can survey a large population and get some data about how people feel and think and what they like and what they don't. We can also talk to those people. But very often we, uh, we take a strategy which is common in design, which is to say we have a spectrum of behavior. Uh, and what we want to do is sort of look, at the, look at, at the ends of the poles, the sort of reasonable extremes, and also in between. And in doing that, we get a much more valuable insight into the range of behaviors. So what we can do then is we can use a lot of smart sampling strategies on the basis of large-scale behavioral data. And what we find is that when we do that, when we're sort of counting over time, when we're looking at holistic patterns of behavior, and then we go to talk to those people, we find two things. Number one, they have incredibly valuable insights. And number two, they want to have a voice. They love the fact that we found them. Because uh, you know, I think one of the things that's a good and bad thing about working at Facebook is that we hear a lot of critiques, a lot of very valid critiques. But the fact is, it matters to people, for good and for bad. And when we can find those logical extremes through the data, so we're using data-informed sampling strategies, we end up with much more powerful insights. That's a strategy that I've seen used that basically every day, at least on my team, we do something in that vein. Yeah, and I think, you know, just to elaborate on that a little bit, I think, you know, when you, when you consider sort of statistical distributions of behavior, you know, we often focus on kind of the mean or the median, maybe some kind of spread around that and say sort of this is somehow the typical behavior. 
Uh, I think in many cases, you know, to Jed's point, there are meaningful extremes. And maybe it's not even a linear spectrum. Maybe it's there are clusters of use cases. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at sort of the typical or, or, or median sort of scenario, you're going to miss out on potentially very useful kind of pockets of interaction or ways of interacting with the product, use cases that we often don't even think of. You know, when you consider Facebook groups, which I'll talk about more in a second, you know, we've identified a number of, of really interesting types of groups. You know, just, just through looking around, through using the product, you see people structuring like for sale groups. Mm -hmm. A fascinating one I found was about selling high-end handmade marbles, like glass marbles <laughs> that were hand blown, like selling for hundreds of dollars. You know, not a scenario that the group's team designed for explicitly, but an adaptation <coughs> with unique kind of characteristics in terms of, you know, social structures mm -hmm. and like bidding behavior and stuff. People are enacting completely on their own in, you know, in the context of a Facebook group. Is that something we would have identified just by kind of looking at the distribution of, you know, comment length or something like that? Absolutely not. Yeah. Purely here's, qualitative insight. That's a great point. And here's another quick example is that we did a study in which we were looking at uh, the behavior of hiding noise, n stories in news feeds. So raise your hand if you, on a regular basis, click that sort of X to hide a story in your Facebook news feed. We do it all the time. Okay, so we wanted to understand more about why people are doing that. So we looked at people who disproportionate to the population over a long period of time were doing a lot of that hiding. And we brought them into our lab to talk to them. And I'm just going to give you a really quick example of one woman who came in. We sort of, uh, we, uh, we, we talked to her about Facebook. She gave us some of the context on her life. It was a qualitative interview. And then we said, okay, well, why don't you log into this machine? I'd just to love, you know, walk, walk you through your general experience looking at Facebook. And so she got onto Facebook. She logged in and she looked at the first story. And she hit it. And then she looked at the second story. And she hit it. And, th and this went on for like, so this was a heavy hider, right? And this went on for about five minutes before the interviewer was like, what is happening, right? And, and, and of course, you know, being a professional said, oh, can you just talk me through what you're doing, you know, what's going on here? It turned out she, her model was inbox zero. What she was doing, she was like, well, I looked at that story already. I got to get it out of there. <laughs> The t existence proof, existence proof. Nobody thinks there's many people out there who, th who are doing that. But as, a, as an extreme example of a misunderstanding of how newsfeed works, it was hugely powerful. Yeah, and, and so to, to, to build on that and kind of move into another example, I think you know, we've seen the same thing with the group recommendations, what we call groups you should join, a little thing that shows you suggested groups. And we've actually had people say exactly the same thing there. Why did you X that one out? Because the team that's building this recommendation model thinks that an X out means that somebody you know, hated the recommendation. It was inappropriate somehow, or they didn't, they didn't want it. Turns out some, some other people were, be, were displaying exactly the same behavior. They said, well, I wanted to see more of them. So I just X that one out so another one would come <laughs> right. in. So it's like, you know, making again, space. If, yeah, making space, exactly. Yeah. So I, you know, this, is a, this is a great example of where sort of assumptions built into these, you know, even very sophisticated machine learning approaches, there are these fundamental sort of questions at the front end that, you know, we don't necessarily think about in advance. Yeah, so there's, pr there's probably a huge machine learning infrastructure built to sort of predict the likelihood that you're going to hide a gr like a group suggestion, right? And then it fundamentally is broken in this way. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember exactly what the percentage of people who do that is, but it's non-trivial. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, to, to build on that, you know, one of the things that one of the ways that I think we can talk about kind of an example of mixed methods data science is this, this case of group recommendations, where again, we have you know, a pretty sophisticated machine learning system and a team that works on sort of figuring out the best groups to recommend to you through, uh, from all sorts of different signals. Now, the thing is, if you just look at sort of like behavioral data about like, hey, which groups do people post in the most or comment in the most or something like that, you know, that can be great input into a machine learning model. However, one of the key issues is that no matter how sophisticated the model, if you don't have the right input, I mean, you all know the sort of garbage in, garbage out, you know, if you don't have the right input, you're not going to get great uh, sort of recommendations out of it. And if you think about, um, you know, some of the sort of sophisticated uh, approaches that can generate kind of nonlinear combinations of features like random forests or something like that, you know, yes, they can identify kind of uh, what's equivalent to a fully interacted, you know, regression model or something like that. But even that fully interactive model doesn't in sort of encode the subject area expertise, the social context that somebody who's studying you know, group usage might be able to bring to the table. So when you think about um, you know, basic signals, how big is the group, how long has it been around, yeah, those should, be, those should be inputs into a model like this. 
But then there are some more subtle things too, like that might not be captured if you just looked at the behavioral data. What if you think about, for example, how many people in the group are friends with each other? Or how many people in the group were added by the creator versus sort of organic growth, like I add Judd, Judd adds uh, Anno, Anno adds other people. You know, that kind of growth might be really different. So uh, Bob Crowd, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, he did a sabbatical with us and he and I worked on sort of a model to understand uh, the sort of success of groups when they were newly created. And we found that, you know, some of the big predictors were th some of those things that I just mentioned. So the behavior of the admin, how the initial growth, growth of the group happens, were huge factors in predicting how long that group would survive. So these types of insights, again, from a survey-based approach, from qualitative coding of responses, all sort of put into a survival model and then using the insights from that to say, all right, here are the features we should put into a group recommendation model. Mm -hmm. So this kind of mixed methods approach where we bring together lots of different ways of understanding the, group user ex the group's user experience and then saying, all right, now we have some intuition and some additional insight into what those features should be for the machine learning model. We're not throwing in the kitchen sink of everything. We're carefully selecting what we think will be sort of socially relevant signals. This is not something that any model in the world can sort of learn on its own. Yeah. So. And, and I think the thing is when you rely on that model, of like, well, here are all the available signals we have and we're gonna junk them into this crazy model. Well, you're at the mercy of what engineers have seen fit to log, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Uh, and, and like t with due respect to any engineers in the audience, like that's not always the best strategy, right? Like very often uh, what engineers have found it convenient to log is not at all what you need to make a really meaningful prediction about a good experience, for mm -hmm. example. So, oh, blank slide. Blank slide. So I don't know how many of you have heard this quote from George Box before, this famous statistician, all models are wrong but some are useful. So, good point. All models are kind of an approximation in some sense. If they were, if they were just sort of reconstructing the data exactly, they wouldn't really be models. They'd just be kind of re-representations of the data. So models involve some kind of simplification and you know, sort of smoothing of the phenomenon, hopefully in a sort of theoretically informative way. Now, the follow-up to this is another quote from George Box. Since all models are wrong, the scientist must be alert to what is importantly wrong. I love this. It's inappropriate to be concerned about mice when there are tigers abroad. <laughs> So what does this mean? If you think back to the group recommendation example, you know, we could spend all day, all year, you know, refining the model fit. We could, we could tweak parameters in the model. We could you know, adjust sort of the way the, you know, we could throw more machines at it, have like more sophisticated approaches to saying, all right, what are the exact parameter estimates that we, you know, we want to put on the variables in this model? But if you don't have the right variables in the model, those are the tigers that are abroad. If you don't have the right inputs, then it doesn't matter how much you put in sort of refining the application of a machine learning algorithm or the development of a whole new approach. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, you, you can optimize all day, but you're optimizing, as Judd put it before, in, into a corner, you know, into a local maximum. You know, the global maximum might be way over here once you identify all the other signals that you should be using. Yeah. So one last quick example, and then I think we can throw it open to questions, is um, I want to talk about personas for a second. So personas is a thing that we, by and large, don't do at Facebook. One of my colleagues has a great phrase, which I repeat, which is essentially, uh, designing with personas is like designing for your imaginary friend, <laughs> right? They become, the, the concern is that they become these kind of caricatures, right? These stereotypes of a person who doesn't exist. And I actually think, I don't know, that might be a little extreme, but what I think is that there's a way in which we, you can and we do sort of data-informed personas, right? So we can, can combine both behavioral and attitudinal data, and we, and we can do some very simple techniques. For example, recently we did this where we had a bunch of sort of aggregated counts of behavior over sort of types of content that people were producing. We had surveyed a bunch of people to ask them about what value they were getting and what they liked and what they didn't like, and then we did k-means clustering. Right? This is a fairly, if you're familiar with this, this is like a fairly simple technique in which we look at all the data and we say, well, let's find the groups on the basis of the data. Right? And what we found out is that that turned out to have some very interesting properties which we could triangulate with qualitative research. We had done a separate interview study in which we, es we ended up with functionally the same set of sort of archetypes. Well, now I feel like that's not an imaginary friend. That's like real people with real behavior and real attitudes. And we know a lot more about not only what's going on, but why it's going on. And I feel great about that. Like to Andrew's point earlier is why, like, okay, we tend to look at statistical moments, the mean and the median and the, you know, the P90 value, whatever it is. But actually, it probably doesn't work that way. People are different in ways that matter, right? So like maybe what we need to do is take that same analysis, but segment it into these four groups 
that matter for a specific purpose. You can call it a persona if you want to, like I don't have a better name, but I think when it's data informed, maybe not data driven because we're being holistic here, but data informed, you get a much more realistic sort of approximation of the world. Should we take some questions? So with that, I think as long as we have available, like yeah, please cut us off when it's time. Yeah, yeah uh, we can thanks so much. Sure. It was a very interesting comment you made about being at the mercy of what engineers choose to log. And I'm kind of wondering how come, like how, what influence you guys have in what's logged and how much negotiation takes place on that front. I think a lot, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, on both, uh, a lot of negotiation because every engineering project has a cost. Um, but that we also have a lot of influence because fundamentally if what we're saying is you have failed to, like, we, here's a body of research which suggests you have failed to log the most important factors in a way that would make it robust for making decisions for, about our products. Well, that's, that's pretty influential in my experience. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a partnership. And I think, like, when we talk about sort of what engineers have chosen to log, it's often in the context of there's something that's been built before and you're coming in to do research on it now. I think when we talk about a new product, we yeah. often are collaborating with the engineers at the time that it's built to get the right logging in place. The other thing I would say, so you know, Judd and I both manage uh, research teams at Facebook. There are also data science teams at Facebook. For my first two years at Facebook, I was on the core data science team. And data scientists tend to have more of a sort of coding background and often will jump in and just implement the logging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, which to be honest is a great thing about Facebook is it's sort of if you, if you have the skills to fix it, go, go to town. How do you reconcile what you're advocating for versus some of the developments in the machine learning side, which is, seems to be focused more on deep learning, very less time spent on feature engineering, just throw this at a whole bunch of raw features and it works like magic? I think it often does work like magic. You know, it, in many cases it does, but I think there are also types of transformations and kind of, kind of uh, synthesized features that combine many features in a way that involves such kind of domain knowledge that you need. You know, for example, the, you know, how many friends do you have in a group? You know, that's something that is not a, so, I mean, the, the um, what's the name for that coefficient? Um, the clustering coefficient, I guess, is one, one name for it. Um, that's not something that I, I think there's any machine learning algorithm that would arrive at that separately, in part because it might require <laughs> inputs that were not anticipated. So if the raw data aren't there, certainly the, the algorithm can't find it. Even if it is there, there may, you know, there may be sort of a cost in terms of convergence. It might be able to identify, you know, something approximating that over time with enough iterations, but it's also usually a lot more efficient if you can specify in advance, we know this is important. I also think to, uh, uh, the magic is not a very good design principle, you know, <laughs> for, for good experiences uh, or, or, or for improving lives. You know, a lot of an what Andrew's team is, is interested in is like how can we really extend the benefits of connectivity um, and, and access to people in the developing world. Well, if that's our goal, like we need more than magic to understand how to do that. We need really deep un understanding of why things are happening. And so you can make a great prediction, but if we don't understand anything about why that prediction matters, then, our, then we're super limited. So I, I think one of the, the biggest fallacies of data science is, for example, that like, well, big data and computer scientists can now step in and solve the problems that social scientists have been struggling and failing against for the last 50 years. I mean, that's such bullshit. Because, <laughs> because actually, there are no computer scientist approaches. There are no CS or machine learning approaches which can really, at a deep level, help you understand why things are going on and how they're happening in a really rich and meaningful way. We need both. We need both. Yeah. There, we were not enemies. We're friends. <laughs> the other thing I would say about, sort of, uh, about, about this as well is that, you know, maybe surprisingly, we often find ourselves in kind of low-end situations uh, that you might not expect. And part of that has to do with the types of segmentation that, you know, that Judd was talking about earlier, where you might have very specific use cases where things are genuinely different and you want a different approach. Same thing with you know, international, international audiences. If you want to understand sort of what friend recommendations or group recommendations should be like, for a woman in rural India. That's, that might be a completely different model mm -hmm. than what you would want like for somebody in the US. 
the needs might be different, the features might be different, and you might not have you know, enough N to sort of fit this globally optimal model, much less sort of the assumption that there is a single global model. So I think that kind of locality, again, there are machine learning approaches that if you put in the right features for location and demographics and things, maybe it will arrive there. And if it does, then that's awesome, because that is a lot easier. Um, but in the cases where it doesn't, you know, putting your thumb on the scale in an informed way, I think, is, is sometimes a powerful technique. <laughs> okay, one last question. Okay. Sorry, Hello. So given that uh, user research and data science are so complementary, why are they often on different teams? Are they just slightly different skill sets, or what's the reason? Uh, great question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the honest answer is organizational politics. Uh, but I, I mean, actually, the reality is like, an, you know, I think Andrew in particular has one foot in both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I'm more solidly in UX. But, you know, if uh, one thing about UX is it's not a useful mo like uh, descriptor for a field of work anymore. I think it used to mean like 10 years ago, it used to mean usability and user testing. But now, like I, I do things which you would probably identify as data science and many people on my team do. Um, but we also do ethnography. And, you know, I think Andrew's team is very similar. Yeah, it's really, I mean, I think in some, in some ways, at Facebook at least, UX research is much broader. It encompasses elements of sort of quantitative research and data science. It also encompasses elements of, you know, ethnography, anthropology. Whereas data science at Facebook is, is much more sort of squarely in the quantitative domain and then includes some things that UX doesn't touch, like Many things, building yeah. recommender systems yeah. and things like that. So, so I think there, there's overlap, but it's not, it's not necessarily, you know, sort of complete. And the other thing is I think, you know, to the point about organizations, I think it's also just a hiring thing, to be honest. It's that, you know, if you talk to recruiters about what skill sets they're looking for, they are they are distinct, at least sort of in the typical cases. And then there's overlap at the mark, you know, at the yeah. at the edges. So. so the practical advice might be whenever you, if you're in the market for a job, like just be careful about the the title and, and, and figure out what the actual work is. Because whether it's you if it's UX, it might be data science. If it's if it's data science, it might be uh, just like monkey analytics, you know, uh, so you got to look into it. That, that's, a, that's a real field. Monkey analytics. Monkey analytics. That'll be the next conference. Yeah. Next conference. All right. Thanks again. Thank you.